President of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, Vice Presidents, Fellows of the Academy, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we've met today for the second day of the GAS Public Forum, which is on non-communicable diseases. For our chairman today, we have Professor Kofi Anyedeho. He's a distinguished poet, a scholar, an educator, and cultural activist. He's a professor of literature, Department of English, and director at the Cordisria African Humanities Institute program at the University of Ghana, where he also served as acting director of the School of Performing Arts, head of English department, and the first occupant of the Kwame Nkrumah Chair in African Studies. He holds a BA Honours in English and Linguistics from the University of Ghana, an MA in Folklore from Indiana University Bloomington, and PhD in Comparative Literature, University of Texas at Austin. He's been a distinguished visiting professor guest lecturer, external examiner, and artist in residence at various universities across the world. Professor Anidoho has published several books of poetry, many journal articles and book chapters, and has edited a number of major books on African literature and the humanities. He was the president of the US based African Literature Association from 1998 to 1999 and has served on various and has served on various boards including the executive committee of Cordisria Dakar the National Commission on Culture the University of Ghana Council and the sponsoring committee for UNESCO special initiative Tagora Neruda Césaire for a a reconciled universal. He was chairman of the Board of Governors of National Films and Television Institute and chairman of the founding council of the University of Health and Allied Sciences, who he's a fellow, a former chairman, a chairman council and current vice president of the arts section, Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was elected to the fellowship of the academy in 2006. Ladies and gentlemen, please let's welcome the chairman for this occasion. President of the Academy, current president, former president, uh, vice president, and uh, fellows, as well as our distinguished guests, and a special welcome once again to the young people who are here for, with us from the schools. They made our day yesterday, and it's looking like they will make it again today. Those who are walking in now, you are welcome. Yesterday, we started with the hall only partially full. By the time it was over, it was almost completely full. And we are hoping that the same thing will happen today. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our two panelists, who will be joined by third panelist uh, as we proceed. The two presentations we listened to yesterday seems to me to set the stage on a broad compass, looking at non-communicable diseases in terms of the detailed profiles of the diseases that constitute that group known as the non-communicable diseases. They talked, both speakers spoke from different angles, but touching briefly on each of the diseases that they identified. Today, I believe the planners of the forum have created an opportunity for at least two or three of those diseases to be treated in some in-depth, given some in-depth treatment. 
And we do have two very, very well qualified people to lead us into the discussions. So I'd like to present, first of all, the first speaker on the panel, Professor Plange Rule, Jacob Plange Rule, a consultant physician and psychologist, and currently the rector of the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons, an experienced medical educator at both the undergraduate and postgraduate levels. He has been a lecturer in the School of Medicine, Medical Sciences at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology for over two decades, two and a half decades. A fellow of the West African College of Physicians, fellow of the Ghana College of Physicians, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians of London, and a past president of the Ghana Medical Association. Professor Planjuru is the Vice Chairman of the MTN Foundation, who we are delighted to acknowledge as the headline sponsors of this program. We'd like to welcome him to the podium. Thank you. Professor Chairman, fellows of the Academy, distinguished audience, invited guests. Let me start by thanking the Academy most sincerely for inviting me to be part of the 2019 public, Annual Public Forum of, of the Academy. I'm grateful for the invitation. Um, today, I've been asked to talk about a subject that is quite dear to my heart. Um, essentially because it is the epidemic of today. It is the one single thing that is driving death in this country. Um, for the purposes of the presentation, I have an outline. I'll give you first an idea of the burden of hypertension around the world and also in the country. Why do we call it a silent killer? We'll find out very soon. We'll talk about the risk factors that underlie hypertension, talk about some of the clinical consequences or complications that can arise from hypertension, say a few things about management, and show evidence of the benefits to each of us when we're able to reduce blood pressures. And then finally, there will be some concluding remarks. Now, for the benefit of the young ones who are with us, I thought that we should start by uh, having some idea of what blood pressure really is. And so for your purpose, blood pressure is essentially the pressure exerted by blood as it flows through blood vessels against the wall of the blood vessels. And the, the pressure is determined by the pumping action of the heart. Now they, harder the, work, uh, the heart works, the bigger the pressure will be. Usually we denote blood pressure by two numbers. There, there's a top number over a lower number. The top number is a systolic blood pressure, which denotes the pressure in the vessels at the time the heart is pumping. And the bottom number, which is the diastolic, is the pressure in the vessels at the time the heart is relaxing between, in between beats. We measure blood pressure in millimeters of mercury. So that's for your information. So really, what is hypertension? Um, first and foremost, we need to recognize that hypertension is a chronic disease. It develops slowly over time. And we would say somebody has hypertension when his blood pressure is persistently elevated above normal levels. I'm sure you are aware that in Akan language, we refer to hypertension as moja brusso. Now that literally means that too much blood, but hypertension is not too much blood. Hypertension is the, is the force generated in the vessels because the heart is doing too much work to pump uh, blood around the vessel and uh, the, the body. We should also recognize that when somebody is hypertensive, it puts that person at, inc at an increased risk of ill health and also complications that can arise from 
the hypertension. So what's the real definition? Now that we know that when you're hypertensive, you have persistently elevated levels of blood pressure, what's the definition? So a sustained elevation of resting systolic blood pressure, which should be 140 millimeters of mercury or above, and or a diastolic pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury or above. So that's what I hypertension is. That's what we, we see to declare that somebody's hypertensive. Now we need to recognize again that there are two different types of hypertension. Now for the purposes of this presentation, we'll be talking about this one, essential hypertension. Essential hypertension basically is hypertension for which you cannot point to a, a single direct cause. We know there are a number of things that can contribute to the development of hypertension but we can't point to one single thing as the cause of the hypertension. And essential hypertension is responsible for about 95% of all the cases of hypertension that we see. The other type is secondary hypertension. And for secondary hypertension, there is a clear identifiable cause. So secondary hypertension is due to hypertension due to another disease. And those diseases could either be an endocrine disorder or it could be because of a narrowing of a blood vessel in the, in the kidneys, for example. So for the rest of the talk, we'll be talking about this. This is responsible only for about 5% of the hypertension we see. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so for somebody to tell you that you have hypertension, you must have your blood pressure measured. And for purposes of initiating treatment, you need to have this done properly and the conditions that ensure that the figure that we get is adequate or is, it's real for purposes of initiating treatment for you. Any health worker can me measure your blood pressure for you and tell you what it is. And also to make the point that there are many electronic BP blood pressure monitoring machines around that people can use for home monitoring. The important thing is that if you have one and you want to use it, please take it to your doctor to ensure that the particular one you have would give you reproducible readings as you monitor your blood pressure. So what's the burden of hypertension? Um, the slide I've got there shows the global burden of hypertension in adults aged 25 years and above around the whole world. And as you see it, look at it, you find that the darker the color, the higher the prevalence of hypertension. And looking at it, you find that the darker colors are mainly in Africa. So you find that there's more prevalence of hypertension within Africa. Overall, there's a global prevalence of about 39% in adults. We also know that hypertension prevalence has been increasing over the last few decades. Uh, this is data showing the trend in progression of hypertension from 2000 towards 2025. In 2000, we had about 970 million hypertensives around the world. It's projected that by 2025, there will be 1.5 or 1.6 billion. Sorry, that was billion. 1.6 billion around the world. Now, the increases are quite true for all areas of the world, including Africa. However, the news that is not good for all of us is that by 2025, 75% of all hypertensives will be in Africa. And that's not good. And we can imagine the complications that can arise from that and the burden on our healthcare delivery system if that's where to happen. This next slide shows the major underlying causes of death in the world. So there are things like unsafe water, sanitation and hygiene, alcohol. But if you look at them, the single most important risk factor by far for death is hypertension, raised blood pressure. And you'd find that it, for both developing and developed world, it is the single factor. It's responsible for about 7 million deaths per year around the world. 
What about Ghana? In Ghana, there are several studies that have shown that hypertension is very common. Indeed, <clears throat> it is the commonest reason for adults presenting at outpatients after malaria. Current prevalence is about 28.3. In adults, the prevalence is higher in men compared to women, and the prevalence is higher in urban communities compared to rural communities. And there must be reasons why that is so. So, one in third Ghanaians older than 40 years is hypertensive. So, if we were to look at all the adults in this room and began to count, we would know that one in three of us has hypertension. I know that some of you may not know that you do have it, but that's the fact. This is looking at data from um, the Ministry of Health. So, there's the District Health Information Management System into which data on attendance to all facilities in the country is reported. And hypertension is one of the uh, cases that are reported into DIMS. For 2017, in excess of 600,000 people reported to facilities with hypertension. And you'd find that two-thirds of that number were females. We believe that the men have a different health-seeking behavior, so they are not really turning up at the facilities to be looked at. The other thing that strikes you is that as one ages, the tendency to have hypertension increases, and this is both true for men and women. So why do we call hypertension the silent killer? The simple reason is that hypertension has no symptoms at all. So you can carry your hypertension, it will be doing all the damage to your organs, and there's no way of you knowing. And I'll tell you a little story. About 11 years ago, <clears throat> as part of the celebration of the World Hypertension Day, we went out into the central dis uh, business district of Kumasi trying to screen people for hypertension. So we went from shop to shop and took people's blood pressure. So we got to this shop, and there was this gentleman probably about 49, 50 years, and we told him why we'd come and we wanted to measure blood pressure. He said, no, 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 no. I'm fine, I haven't been ill my life. There's nothing wrong with me. I come to work every day, so please, I don't want my blood pressure measured. We managed to convince him, and finally when he agreed, you will be surprised that his blood pressure was 250 over 130. Now, the normal values are 120, 80. Yet, this man comes to work every day. He's well. That's hypertension for you, the silent killer. So, for most people, you'd find that we diagnose hypertension really by chance. So, you may turn up in the hospital for something totally unrelated to hypertension, and as they measure your blood pressure, they will find that you, your blood pressure is high. For others, hypertension, you will get to know that you have hypertension for the first time because you presented with a complication or other. It could be a stroke that brought you. It could be that you've gone into heart failure and that's why you presented. So the point I'm trying to make is that unless you measure, you would not know that you have hypertension. So it's important to measure regularly and to monitor your blood pressure on on a regular basis. So what are the risk factors that drive hypertension? There are two types. One type, excuse me. One type of risk factors we would refer to as non-modifiable factors. These are factors we can do nothing about. So one of them is your genetic makeup. So we know that hypertension tends to run in families. First degree relatives who are hypertensive, who have hypertensive relatives, are more likely to also develop hypertension. But you can't change your genetics. The other one is ethnicity. So again, we know that hypertension is more common in blacks. 
compared to Caucasians. And in blacks, the hypertension is more severe, and it also occurs at, a more, at an earlier age compared to uh, Caucasians. The other factor is age. As you age, with hardening of your blood vessels, your blood pressure inevitably goes up. So age is one of the things. And indeed, if you are 50 and you haven't got hypertension, the risk, the chances of developing hypertension for the rest of your life is close to 100%. So by all means, you'll get it. And that's why we always need to check. So if you haven't got it today, don't say that, oh, I'm 60, I don't have it, so I'm fine. Please keep checking. I hope that you don't find it, but at least if you keep checking and you find it, you can do something about it early. Then there are the modifiable risk factors, and these are factors that are steeped in lifestyle. So these are things that we do to ourselves, and they give us hypertension. So unhealthy diets, but for the purpose of this particularly diet that is high in salt. Yesterday we listened to uh, the fact that our eating habits have changed, and uh, now we're doing more takeaway and we're doing more check check and all of that. Those foods are full of salt. The other thing that drives hypertension is overweight and obesity, and the other factors being physical inactivity, inadequate fruit and vegetable intake, harmful use of alcohol and smoking. So these are all lifestyle issues, but they drive hypertension. But they also give us an opportunity to be able to do something about hypertension when we do have it. This is just evidence to show you that if you subjected people to modest reductions in salt intake over one month or more, you'd find that as your urinary yours. We're using urinary sodium as a measure of sodium intake. So as your sodium intake reduces, whether you are normal tensive or you are hypertensive, your blood pressure will fall. So it's always beneficial to reduce your salt intake. <clears throat> Let's talk about detection, treatment, and control. Hypertension is one of the very easy things to measure, or blood pressure is one of the easy things to measure and to diagnose. Also, there's a lot of simple, efficacious medications available for hypertension. However, hypertension is poorly detected and treated, not just in the developing world, but also in the developed world. In the developed world, the control rates for hypertension is less than 25 percent. In the developing world, it's even worse. It's less than 10%. Now, what it means, and I'll, I'll explain from here. Here, what I've done is to put a number of studies that's been carried out in Ghana, starting from 1979 to about 2008, and to look at the percentage of people who have hypertension who are aware of their condition, the percentage who are on treatment, and the percentage who are, who are controlled. You'd find that on the average, only about two thirds of one third of people with hypertension know that they have hypertension. So two thirds of everybody who has hypertension has no clue that he's got it. He's living with it, and one day he's going to explode. I'm sure you hear of people, oh, he was sitting here just now, he collapsed, he's got a stroke, he's dead. So as he's sitting there, the hypertension is doing his magic slowly, and one day he strikes. Now, of this one third, that is known to have hypertension. Only about 50% of them, as you see here, are on treatment. So there's also a large number of people who know they are hypertensive, but there are no treatment. If we are lucky to be on treatment, we find that even a smaller percentage of those on treatment have their blood pressures controlled. So we really have a big job to do, really, all of us. This slide essentially shows you the, if you like, the pathway, um, starting with the social determinants of, um, if you like, cardiovascular disease. So globalization, urbanization, um, a higher income, so better food, more processed food, and all of that. So if you have more money, you start doing all the unhealthy things. 
your blood pressure goes up and your blood pressure will then cause you to have cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, and kidney disease. <clears throat> so these are the three main complications or clinical consequences of hypertension, and we'll run through them quickly. So cardiovascular diseases, these are diseases of blood vessels, are the main causes of ill health and death in Ghana. And the major risk factor driving that is hypertension. So 70% of all the people with heart failure you see will have it because of hypertension. More than 70% of the people with strokes that you see will have it because of hypertension. And for people who have chronic kidney disease, you'd find that about a third of them will have it because their blood pressure is not controlled. So this graph just shows you the influence on, of hypertension on the risk of developing a stroke or a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. And as you see, the five-year risk of developing a stroke or a heart attack increases as your systolic blood pressure increases. So the higher your blood pressure, the greater your risk of developing uh, one of these really quite serious complications of hypertension. This is data from the Confanochi Teaching Hospital looking at the um, number of total numbers of cases presenting on admission with strokes. And you'd find that starting from the early 80s, we, we are seeing a continuous increase in the numbers of people who are coming on admission with stroke. Again, this slide shows data from an outpatient cardiology clinic. And what we see there is that the commonest ca cardiac disease that presents is heart disease that is driven by hypertension. It accounts for more than a third of all the people who present at the outpatient's clinic. Now let's look at kidney disease. This is data from um, Kolebu, Dr. Jumwe Du is here, this is from his group. And you find that of all the people seen in Kolebu with chronic kidney disease, more than one third of it have it because of hypertension. So we have an idea of the havoc that hypertension can cause to all of us. This is again data from people Again, people who have hypertension, these are normal people walking around doing their own business, but have hypertension and turn up at the clinic. And you find that even though they are well and doing everything they, they are doing, close to half of them have some stage or other of kidney disease. So they go to the clinic, collect their medications, go to work, do, go about their normal duties, but they carry some burden of kidney failure you'd find that, yes, a number of them are in the uh, first to third stages, but there are a few at the top. And the more you get to stage five, the chances of you needing dialysis. And we know how expensive dialysis can be. Okay, so how do we look after people with hypertension? Obviously, you make a diagnosis, you do your investigations, if you have to rule out a secondary cause of the hypertension, you do that. And then you initiate treatment, and of course you need to think about continuing treatment. I've highlighted patient education as one of the crucial things to ensure that people understand what they have. I've seen many people come to the clinic and will say to me, oh, I had hypertension five years ago, but you know they gave me a month's cause of anti-hypertensive, so it's gone. Hypertension doesn't go. It lives with you. So you have to be friends. It, once you're friends with your hypertension, it will look after you, and you have to look after your hypertension by making sure that you, you provide the medications. Of course, once you initiate treatment, patients will have to come up back for follow-up and review. So what are the components of the plan? As I said, the modifiable risk factors for hypertension, they are steeped in lifestyle, and there are things that we can do. So the first component is lifestyle, changing our diets to a healthier diet, 
and exercising. And of course, we support that with medications. So the lifestyle modification things I've shown there, reduce weight, reduce salt intake, reduce alcohol, increase your physical activity. WHO recommends five, uh, 30 minutes of brisk walking every day as being enough you know, to, to meet that. They also recommend five portions of fruits and vegetables a day for your hypertension. So I think that we should all be doing that. Again, WHO recommends that we take less than five grams of salt a day in our food. On the average, people are taking between nine and 12 grams in this country. Now, that is nowhere near what WHO recommends. So there's always room for us to try and do the things that would help us bring our blood pressure down. Even if you don't have hypertension, the lower your blood pressure, the better for you in terms of health outcomes. Then we would provide the medications, and there are many classes of antihypertensive drugs to choose from. One of the important things to do with the drugs is that patients who are put on medication need to make sure that they take their drugs regularly. You can't say that, oh, I forgot. You remember to eat every day. You remember to have your bath every day. So why don't you remember to give your hypertension a bath by taking your medications? Um, so patient education helps, and you sh patients must understand that they need to come back for follow-up. Now, what are the benefits of treating and controlling our hypertension? And I showed this. This is a study from Finland um, where they tried to, if you like, make people live healthy lives, and there were a number of components to it. But one of the components to it was to try and get them to reduce their salt intake over time. The study started in 1972, and they've been collecting data over that time. So you see that reduction in salt intake over time is mirrored by reductions in diastolic blood pressure. So blood pressure will go down if you reduce your salt intake. The good thing, as you see here, is that that reduction in blood pressure is mirrored by um, a reduction in deaths from strokes. So reducing your blood pressure really is beneficial to you. I was talking about the various things you should do, and this is just to show how, by how much you can reduce your blood pressure, for example, by reducing your sodium intake or by reducing your weight. So if you, are reduced, you were to reduce your weight by 10 kilos, for example, you will reduce your blood pressure by between 5 and 20 millimeters of mercury. Now, this slide again is showing the same thing, looking at the benefits you get when you, when you reduce your systolic blood pressure on the average by about between 12 and 13 millimeters of mercury. So heart attacks will reduce if you reduce your blood pressure. Strokes will reduce if you reduce your blood pressure. And death from cardiovascular disease will reduce. So in conclusion, um, hypertension is an important cause of ill health and death in this country. Everybody Certainly, if you're an adult, you should know what your blood pressure is and keep monitoring it to be sure that it's not going up. Persons with hypertension, when they are given, need life, uh, health-promoting lifestyle modifications so they can prevent the development of the complications of hypertension. And we need to make sure that we treat to control blood pressure so that we're able to reduce the cardiovascular disease incidence associated with high blood pressure. And really, if you're on medication, you need to make sure you take them regularly. Because there are real benefits to you when you keep your blood pressure under control. Finally, this is, I wanted to quote something from Jeremiah 4.18. And it says, your ways and your doings have brought this upon you. This is your doom, and it is bitter, and it has reached your very heart. So do not let your doings bring hypertension upon you. It will be bitter when it reaches your heart. 
Don't let your hypertension kill you silently. Thank you very much. I didn't hear amen when he... <laughs> <laughs> we thank the first speaker for that presentation, although the subject matter was kind of heavy. He presented it in a very friendly manner and gave us a lot of assurance that it is a big problem, but it is manageable. We thank you for that. We call the second speaker, Professor Joe Knight Clerk Lamte, a professor of surgery at the University of Ghana School of Medicine and Dentistry, a product of Infancipim and the University of Ghana Medical School. He had his specialist training in Ghana and the United Kingdom between 86 and 96. And since his return to Ghana in 97, he has devoted his energies to the training of medical students and surgical specialists and to the fight against breast cancer. He thus co-founded Reach for Recovery, Ghana, a breast cancer survivors group, started the Kolebu Breast Clinic and has been a regular advisor to the Ministry of Health in developing guidelines and policies on cancer management in Ghana. Prof. Leglamte has served on committees and councils of national and international organizations, including the West African College of Surgeons, Breast Health Global Initiative, ESMO Africa, and the Pfizer Student Breast Cancer Regional Council for Asia and Africa. He has been speaker at many local and international meetings and symposia where he has highlighted the situation of breast cancer in Ghana and other developing countries. A former head of the Department of Surgery at the University of Ghana Medical School and Kolebu Teaching Hospital, Prof. Kleglante is author of six books and editor of two breast cancer training manuals. He has also authored general articles and book chapters on breast cancer. We would like to invite him to come to the podium. Uh, thank you very much. I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak um, on a topic that's also quite dear to my heart. Um, we are going to talk about cancers. And the, and the very obvious first question is what it's cancer. Basically, cancer is a condition in which you have abnormal cells which are dividing uncontrollably. And by doing that, they gather more or more of them and then they become lumps or what we call tumors. A tumor is just a swelling. And also they invade surrounding structures with beads, organs, or tissues around them, they begin to invade those things. So first of all, we talk about they being a lump. Now, not every lump is a cancer. You can see a very huge lump in the breast, but this is not cancer. This is not. So it's not every lump that's a cancer. Professor Kosa will have to tell us whether this is a cancer or not, to the pathologist you need. But this one is a cancer. It's a cancer in somebody's neck, the thyroid gland which is enlarged. And you can see it's affecting the breastbone, or the, we call it the sternum, um, as well. So that is a cancer. So it's not everything that appears to be a cancer that is one. Now, it's from the word crab, the Latin word for crab. And Hippocrates, who is the father of uh, medicine, first used it. He used the word carcinos and carcinoma. And in fact, we still use carcinoma to, to describe cancers to describe non-ulcer and ulcer-forming tumors in the, in the body. You see, the way the crab is, with, with, it has these um, plenty legs, some for swimming and so on, and it has these things for biting, claws and so on. So it gives the idea of a wicked-looking um, um, organism. But perhaps the most, what describes it, it most is, is the everyday usage of the word. I mean, we, we say something, it's a cancer if the thing is an evil or destructive force that is very hard to eradicate. So you can talk about the cancer of, of mob justice in Ghana, for example. 
So that tells you how cancers are. They are, they are bad. If you, let me just, just put it that way. Now, how, how actually, what causes it? I uh, won't go into details here. But basically, it's a change or a mutation of some genes in the body. Um, the students, you know, we have cells is the most basic unit um, the human body, and you have the nucleus and the cytoplasm, and within the nucleus, you have chromosomes, okay, forming your DNA, and so on. So, if there's a change in any of of these, some of these, some of these genes, it can actually lead to abnormal behavior of the cells. Cells are supposed to live for some time and die for some time. It's all program, program cell death, but sometimes it doesn't happen, and they won't die, and they are growing, and they are. Be, um, behaving like like the crap, then you say you have a cancer. Okay, I won't show about this one. So it's the genes which are in your nucleus, which which is the problem. We can be born with these genes as well, but the other ones which we call proto oncogenes. So these ones may be quite normal, but when they are changed, then they make the cell begin to be abnormal. So there's a, there's a balance between what you have inherited from your parents, your genes, and the environment. I'm not talking about the room. When we say environment, in this case, we are talking about everything that interacts with a human being, everything that interacts with a woman. And we've been talking about some of them already since yesterday. So exposure to tobacco, to alcohol. And Professor Paju has literally spoken about a lot of these things, obesity, lack of exercise, and with diet again. With diet, it's basically a, a case of we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. So we don't eat the things that we should eat, the vegetables and the fruits, and then we eat the things that we should not eat. And that's can predispose to all non-communicable diseases, in fact, but to cancers as well. Pollutants, yesterday we talked about air pollution and all that. Yesterday we talked about tobacco a lot. Tobacco is bad. Um, it virtually is, has been linked with almost, not almost, most cancers. And by the way, cancers can affect almost any part of the body. So cancers of the lip, the mouth, the throat, Esophagus, the lungs, the stomach, the colon, kidneys, urinary bladder, pancreas, um, breasts, cervix. So tobacco is bad, and so we. I used to say that Ghana has done so well in bringing down the usage of tobacco, but unfortunately, we are getting this new phenomenon, shisha or shashi, or um, which which people are now beginning to smoke. But thankfully, I think public opinion is so much against it, and we should all do something about um, discouraging the use of, of these things. But tobacco is bad. So what's the impact of cancer? You could put it on that too. There's the local impact. So you have the cancer which starts in a part of the body, and then the systemic is the general, affects the whole body. So they look out. So it begins in a part of the body. So the part of the body, it becomes swollen. It may become, or it's likely to become painful, deformed. Um, the function of the part may be lost. So the arm may be so painful that you can't use the arm anymore, and so on. And they may break through the skin and become a sore or ulcer and may be bleeding. But cancers don't just spread locally. They may jump into the blood or into the lymphatics and be carried to distant organs. So you can have a cancer in the breast, for example, and it will appear in the brain or it will appear in the lung or in the bones. And because of that, it causes more harm. So the people may become very unwell with it, anemic, jaundiced, and so on. And it can lead to the organ itself failing, the organ that it has gone, and then eventually leads to death. So it is a dangerous thing. So how common is cancer? So quickly about globally, 
that the whole world last year, 2018, this is from the World Health Organization. It says that there were 18.1 million cases of cancer in the world and 9.6 people died from cancer. And if you take all deaths, one out of six deaths in the world was due to cancer. So the common ones are there, lung, number one, that's the whole world. Lung is number one, then breast, then colorectum. Yesterday, somebody was asking about colorectum. Colorectum and then the prostate. So that's a pictorial view of the whole, of the very same thing. So lung is number one, about two million cases of lung cancer followed by breast, about the same number really, both of them being 11.6%, and then we had um, the colorectum and then prostate. So this is, if you like, a cancer map. Cancer map, looking at cancer in males. Again, like Professor Pranjuru showed, the deeper the color, the higher the incidence rate. And you can see that it is commoner in North America, the US, Canada, Western Europe, Australia. Those are the places where it's common. And in fact, Africa is very pale, which means that cancer is not common in Africa at all. And people are saying, hey, this is somebody is getting cancer. Cancer, in other words, we should get ready for more. <laughs> cancer is not common here at all, comparatively. So that's for males. This is for females. Again, the deeper the color, the higher the incidence, the same thing. Western Europe, North America, Australia. They are the main, other colors look deeper than they actually are, is the projection. But it's mainly North America, Western Europe, and Australia. And again, Africa is quite pale. So let's come to Ghana. These are our numbers. Last year, so this is WHO figures. Last year, they say we're about 29 and a half million there were 22,000 cases of cancer in Ghana. 15,000 people died from cancer in Ghana last year. Let's make this closer. And cancer is the fourth leading cause of death in Ghana. We'll make it closer. So the first one is the cardiovascular diseases. Mr. Pran, you have been talking about it. Then you, we have malaria, lower respiratory tract infection and then cancer. So cancer is actually quite common, and it's a common cause of death in this country. Looking at all cancers that we see in Ghana, the commonest is breast cancer. So that's that. So last year, we had over 4,000, according to WHO, over 4,000 cases, new cases of breast cancer in Ghana followed by cervical cancer, 3,000, liver cancer, and then we had prostate cancer. So the females have taken one and two for themselves. So the two commonest cancers affect women, breasts and cervix. One out of five cancers in Ghana is breast cancer, and that is quite high. With the males, prostate is the highest. So prostate cancer is number one, followed by liver, then colorectum, um, and then lymphomas. So if you put both together, breast cancer is number one, cervix is number two. Sorry, this is a female, sorry. We've done the total. So for females, breast one, cervix two, ovary three, and then liver follows us in that order. So these are the 10 top cancers. I hope nobody's counting because it's not 10. But 10 top cancers in Ghana. And the first column tells you the incidence numbers, um, a standardized rates, and then the mortality, that's deaths from cancers as well. I would like to highlight, so for breast cancer, if you look at the numbers, 4,000, deaths, 1,000. So it's about, let's say, 30% of the numbers um, or so, or so of people who get breast cancer dying. But look at cervix, literally two out of three, 3,000, 2,000. And look at liver, practically everybody dies. 
2,753 people have liver cancer, and the number of deaths from liver cancer, almost the same number, almost, just a little less. So it tells you how fatal some of these cancers are, and unless we do something about it, then it will be very good. We say that cancer is an emerging threat. Why do we say so? Or why is it an emerging threat? A lot have, has changed with time. I put it under then and now. So in the past, before a lot of young people were born, a lot of people died. It was almost normal if you have five children, two will die kind of thing. So a lot of children were dying at birth, childhood diseases and so on were killing them. Uh, malaria and so on. And the people who lived, lived relatively, that's the adults who lived after that, lived relatively healthy lives, walk to the farm, eat healthy foods, no smoking and all that. But things have changed. And then we had the reproductive factors. The women tended to have a lot of children, uh, they breastfed them and so on. But now things have Changed. We have become westernized. And again, all the things we've been talking about since yesterday, unhealthy lifestyles, tobacco, the reproductive factors, again, we tend to delay births now. So people have births late. They have fewer beds, they don't breastfeed, and these are all risk factors for breast cancer, for example. Um, then there's exposure to all these environmental factors, viruses, sexually transmitted viruses like HPV, for cervical cancer, and so on, HIV. These are all risk factors. So things have changed in our environment, and these are, are, are driving it. There's an additional threat. There's an additional threat of poverty. A former director of the National Cancer Institute, um, said something which was very momentous. He says, poverty is a carcinogen. Poverty is a cause of cancer. Now, it's, it's not really true, but it is true. And we, have, we are operating at two levels at the moment. We have the middle class who are doing everything they can to live like the Westerners, so they're getting the Western diseases. And we have the very poor also among us. Now, the poor are subjected to increased environmental pollution. They also have a risky lifestyle. They tend to smoke, and we heard it yesterday, they tend to smoke more than the rich, both passive, and they are crammed in all sorts of places. And they are, they are exposed to a lot of cancer risk, environmental contamination. We dump a lot of things that we don't want in, in, in Sodom and Gomorrah and so on less access to nourishing food, adequate insurance, health care, and so on. So the poor has a disadvantage, and it's been shown that poverty itself can be considered a carcinogen. So now we are operating on two levels. We have poor people, and we have the middle class, and we are all competing to increase our cancer risk, which is sad. If, even without the risk factors, demographically alone, tells us that we are going to be getting more cancers. Now, this is the shape of this, this 2017 in Ghana. You can see a lot of young people, and as you move up the population pyramid, it gets very narrow. Yesterday, again, we heard that the life expectancy is increasing. People are living longer. And very soon, we will start approximating to, let's say, the UK, that pyramid. Once you get an older population, you start getting diseases that old people get. So by demographics alone, cancer will increase. So cancer will be increasing. So can we prevent it? Yes and no. Yes, we can. If we can avoid the causes of cancer and we can promote healthy lifestyle, yes. But no, some factors are not modifiable. You can't modify your genes, for example, your gender, you're a woman, because of that you're at risk from breast cancer, for example. And there are other cancers which don't have a known trigger at all. So yes, but no. And many people develop cancer who have no risk factor at all. 
And there are people who have risk factors and never develop breast cancer. Not just breast. I'm used to saying breast. Never develop cancer at all. Therefore, what is important, not just the lifestyle changes, not just doing things that will promote healthy living, but we just, we are all at risk. So we must all screen and look out for cancer, detect it early enough so we can do something about it. Can we win the war against cancer or are we winning the war? I got this graph from the WHO Cancer Mortality Database and tried to derive these graphs from it. So it's far away, you may not see. But one of them, the top ones, one of them is the UK, one of them is the US, one of them is Australia. So I took where its cancers are common. And then the only African country I could find was Mauritius, which had data there. Now this is about mortality, deaths from breast cancer. Since the 1990s, from there, you can see a drop in deaths from cancer in the developed world, these are rates. It is just dropping. And Africa, I see by design, decides that now we are going to go up. So whilst they are dropping their rates, we are now dying more. And these are rates. We are dying more from breast, from breast cancer. So we are not winning here. What have they done successfully? We have to look at what they've done and do something about it. Prevent cancer. It's the same thing. Prevent cancers where possible. Screen our populations for those at risk. Diagnosing them before they even become evident. Educating and investing in research into cancer and providing diagnostic and treatment facilities. And we have not really done any of this in a concerted way. We've done something, especially in tobacco, we did something. Then there's the problem about delay between when people first detect cancer and when they report. Now it is too long. And the delays are due to the people themselves ourselves. And sometimes the system that we run, the system is not good. And sometimes the healthcare prof professionals who are the problem. It's been shown that if you, be, you wait for more than three months from the time cancer is first detected or first, the symptoms first appear and treatment, if it's more than three months, it leads to a poor outcome. But look, breast cancer in Ghana, the patients in Accra, 10 months on average before they come. In Kumasi, 12 months before they come. So that alone tells you, and this is before the health system also puts in its delays. And so this is one of our problems. We have a competition in the hospitals. We are being competed against seriously. Pastors and prayer comes, herbalists, WhatsApp, and social media, they will tell you that Johns Hopkins says this. Somebody just writes something and people believe it. Okay, so they say this plant can kill cancer cells in 16 hours. It will kill all of them. Another one will kill 86% of lung cancer and we see how lung cancer is killing people. I like this one. How to prevent the deadliest of all cancers by eating this one thing and you can kill all them. So we have a lot of competition which is not helping us. Access to diagnostic and treatment facilities is not good enough, and I wouldn't want to keep too long in it. Yesterday we talked about personnel. For example, we have just about 30 pathologists when it comes to diagnosis. 30 pathologists in the whole country, 11 of them are in Kolibu alone. So the rest of the country is not well served. The same thing with radiologists. Right, so we'll leave that. Now, this is probably my, one of my last slides. Now, can, treatment of cancer is, is not cheap. I think people need to understand that. Um, policymakers need to understand. Everybody needs to know. It is not cheap. Um, it is very expensive. And until we decide to put more resources into it, it's going to be killing all of us. So in conclusion, we've said that cancer is an emerging threat. It's an emerging health problem. And the incidence is projected to increase. Um, and then there's the delay in treatment, which obviously is affecting the survival. 
And many times, people don't even have treatment at all. What we need to do is to implement the policies. I didn't say de derive policies, because the policies are there. We, they've been done. They are lying there. Um, so we need to implement these policies. And we need to educate the general public and improve funding. Funding, we have had enough funding from outside. I think we should know that we have to now allocate resources for cancer treatment. Um, I don't have a Bible quotation, but we need more resources. I like this proverb. If somebody is scratching, it's bathing your back. You to bath your front. So we've had enough resources. It's time we put resources into cancer treatment. Thank you very much. Shall we say another thank you to So we go from challenges posed by high blood pressure, challenges posed by cancer of the various cancers, and to something else that many of us don't even bother to think about. We don't hear enough about it, mental health. And it is my special pleasure to invite the anchorman on problems of mental health in Ghana today, <laughs> Dr. Kwesi Osu Osei. Dr. Osei had his O-level training at Jamna Kenteng Secondary School in Ofinso in the Ashanti region. Then his A-level from St. John's Secondary School, second D. Completed his basic medical training at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology School of Medical Sciences. Obtained the fellowship of the West African College of Physicians. That was way back in 1999. And in between, he went to John Hopkins University School of Public Health and Mental Hygiene, Baltimore in Maryland, the U.S., with a Hubert Humphrey Fellowship in Substance Abuse. On his return, Dr. Ose headed the Anchor Full Psychiatric Hospital for some time, and later the Accra Psychiatric Hospital, and was appointed Chief Psychiatrist of the Ghana Health Service. He also proceeded for an international diploma in mental health legislation and human rights in India, where he was also a faculty member of the institution where he went. Later still, he went for an LLB degree from Mount Christ University College here in Accra appointed Chief Executive Officer of the Mental Health Authority in 2015. Dr. Jose is a Foundation Fellow of the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons, a faculty member of the International Masters in Global Mental Health Program at KNUST, and at various times, a part-time lecturer or senior lecturer at the medical schools in Ghana, various medical schools in Ghana. KNUST, University of Health and Allied Sciences, Family Health Medical School, School of Public Health, and GIMPA. He was also a trainer and examiner in the West African College of Physicians and the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons, as well as the Kintampo College of Health and Wellbeing. Dr. Ose has 25 articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals, 125 newspaper articles, four words and chapters in three books, a, review, a reviewer for a number of journals. He has published a book on psychiatry and has two other others in press, including the history of mental health care in Ghana. And outside psychiatry, he has published three other books while four others are waiting to be published. 
Don't have a say. Welcome. Thank you very much, Prof. Prof. President of the Academy and uh, the Chairman, distinguished fellows of the Academy, ladies and gentlemen. We are looking at the burden of mental health conditions. But I want to thank you very, very much for this opportunity, not so much because of me per se, but the fact that mental health is being given the recognition as a significant player in the causes of burden of disease in Ghana. So we are happy. The mental health generally is an area that not many people are really interested, even doctors and medical students shy away from. And for that reason, I thought that you need to spend a little bit of time to explore the concept of mental health and mental illness so that we can come to the same page and then we can discuss further. Then you look at the state of mental health and then the conditions that affect us and then the impacts. And then a little bit on the financial support that we get or we don't get and then the way forward. So in terms of the concept of mental health, mental illness, let's move from the known to the unknown. So health and then you move to mental health. So WHO defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So we have mental there. And that tells us that there is no health without mental health. And if you talk about mental health, or if you talk about health, the mental health means total health. So it becomes very important. That mental health, again, WHO defines it as a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own potential, her own abilities, can cope with the normal stresses of life and can work productively and fruitfully and is able to make a contribution to his or her community. Now, this is quite loaded. It's a state of well-being. The well-being itself means a lot. And uh, what it's basically saying is that for you to, for us to say that you have mental health, you should be able to cope with the daily stresses of life. Now you wake up in the morning, maybe 5 a.m., 6 a.m., you dress up, you come, your household chores, you get into your vehicle, uh, or if you are boarding commercial, there is some taxi driver who is crossing you and insulting you, and you are wondering why. Eventually you go to work, frustrations there, you come back home. Now all these are issues that if you don't break down, it's only because you have mental health. But because you have mental health, we take it for granted. It's like daytime and darkness. It's only when you have lights off, then you begin to recognize the importance of light. So that is mental health. Now, so this state of mind is such that you should be able to cope with the daily stress of life and be productive. If you wake up and you are not able to go to work and be productive, by this definition, there is something wrong. So that shows that, and that also, you should have meaning in life. Now, meaning in life is important. I once listened to a show, KSM show, and the person he was interviewing as the interview went on, he said that I have a big problem with God. What is your problem? Why did God create me, bring me to Africa for me to suffer every day? Somebody sitting in Europe, he has life very easy for him. I have a problem with God. So as I listened, I said, are you safe? <laughs> <laughs> then as he proceeded, he says, and in fact, even God comes and talks to me. So it became clear. This person is not seeing meaning in life. That is a very important attribute in mental health. Now, when people are mentally well, they are generally happy and can go about their daily activities in spite of the challenges and the mishaps of life. 
But does it mean that if you at some point become sad, you are mentally unwell? Not exactly, but the definition seems to imply that. And so to cure that situation where people think the definition might imply that you could be sad at some point or unhappy and therefore that might mean you are mentally ill, people are even proposing that we need to get a better definition than we have. So they have a complex one which is, says mental health is a dynamic state of internal equilibrium which enables individuals to use their abilities in harmony with universal values of society. And the basic cognitive and social skills, ability to recognize, express, and modulate one's own emotions, as well as empathize with others, flexibility and ability, and it goes on and on. But most important, what we are saying is that you should be at ease within yourself and at peace with others. It should be possible for somebody to step on your toe and you say, that's fine. But somebody steps on your tone and you burst out, there is something wrong. <laughs> you should have a harmonious relationship between the body and the mind. These are very important components that you need to get. Now there's another concept. When there is no mental health, does one necessarily have mental illness? No. If you don't have mental health, you may have mental ill health. In fact, you have mental ill health but not necessarily mental, Ill, mental illness. But if you say, and that, in fact, there's a, a local language that says, yen yaren su yen tiapo. You are not sick, but you are, not, you are not well. In the same way, if you are not mentally sick, but you are not mentally ill, you are mentally unwell. Yen yaren but yen tiapo. And that concept is uh, indicated here. If you are within this area, you are mentally Ill, uh, you, are, you have mental health. If you go outside that, you have mental ill health, where you feel a little funny, but you are really not to the point where we can say you are, on, you, are you are ill. If you go beyond that, then you have mental illness, and that requires that you re, you need to be treated. So, mental illness is a condition of state of mind in which there is significant maladaptation to yourself to the environment or society, and this manifests as disturbances in your mood, your feeling state, your speech, your perception, your behavior, and your cognitive functions. And depending on the severity, you may be out of touch with reality. But often we tend to think that mental illness is one entity. Mental illness is not one entity. Malaria is one illness. Pneumonia is one illness. Mental illness is not one entity. Indeed, there are over 300 types of mental illnesses. That is defined by ICD, which is International Classification of Disorders, and the DSM, uh, this Diagnostic, Statist Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Now, so it's actually more accurate to say mental illnesses than mental illness. But for our purpose, you will still say mental illness, but let's understand that there are different things. Now, you can also broadly look at it as being of two main types. There's the major one, which we call psychosis, and there's a minor one, which in former times would have called neurosis. Now, the, the major one, which you call psychosis, is the type that the person may not realize that he has a problem but you know he has a problem. So he may go out naked, for instance, and he sees nothing wrong, and on the other hand thinks there is something wrong with you for being clothed. And there are different types of this, schizophrenia, bipolar, and whatnot. Now, there is also the minor illness in which he himself knows he has a problem, and you don't know he has a problem. For instance, you get up in the morning, you are going to work, you lock your door, you take a few steps and you, something tells you no, you have not checked your door, you've not locked your door. You go back, you check, it's locked. Normally that should be fine. You take a few steps again, say, no, 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 you didn't check it well. <laughs> and you go and you check and it's locked. 
and it can happen 10 times. That is mental illness of the minor type. You call that OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Somebody may decide that my hands are dirty, so I need to wash. Well, your hands are dirty, you wash, that should be fine. But this person says, no, I've not washed properly. So you'll go and wash 10, 20 times. Or he meets somebody, no, I won't shake up. I won't shake his hands or her hands because everybody's hands are dirty. This is an abnormal illness. Somebody else, now as you are sitting here, if you see a tiger or snake from wherever, we will all run away and I probably will beat Hussein Bull's uh, uh, record. But a cockroach comes here and I want to jump to the ceiling, there is something wrong. is phobia, fear, not house phobia, but fear. Indeed, somebody cannot be on can, uh, Kakum canopy walk because he fears height. Such a person cannot be in the plane and sit by the window because he thinks that the earth is opening for him to be solid. Fear of height is mental illness. And these are a lot. Somebody cannot be in a vehicle or even in a lift. He cannot be in a lift because he feels that the, lim the lifts or an escalator is clamping on him. Fear of an enclosed space, mental illness. And there are a whole lot of them. So if you put all this together, then you really have, you realize we have a lot. Now having got that understanding, what is the state of our mental health in Ghana? The positive, non negative. We don't have a national household survey yet, but we have proxy information that's from, for instance, happiness index, and from uh, our stress levels. By happiness index, I'm not suggesting that happiness is necessarily equivalent to mental health, but it's a significant attribute of mental health. And recently, in fact, there was a WHO, no, not WHO, there was a 2019 World Happiness Report that ranks all countries and Ghana is occupying 99, in fact, there were 156 countries, and Ghana is occupying 99 with 4.99 points. The happiest country, Finland, had 7.769 out of total of 10. And Ghana, even with our low, we are ranked sixth in Africa, behind Libya, Nigeria, Algeria, Morocco, and Cameroon. <laughs> now, now, the validity is, is suspect, but the fact remains that there are issues. Now, correlated to psychological distress. Now, psychological distress, we are looking at the extent to which you have issues in your mind that you are not really able to resolve, and it's eating you up. And this study was done by uh, scholars from University of Ghana and Yale in 2009, published in 2013. And they found that Ghanaians had 41% psychological distress. 45 from women and 37 men. So women have more issues. 90% of them were moderate to severe. Enough for us to call it mental illness. 90% comes to about 20%. So that comes to roughly the figures you know, one in five. So for every fifth person, just as Prof. Jacob Plangeru said, for every fifth person, it means some, one person has something, one fifth. But I must also say that it is, if you, if you shuffle all the 30 million Ghanaians, and you take any five, then one person has, and not select few that we have here. So you are, you are, you are free, so it's not necessarily <laughs> <laughs> Now, there are specific conditions that are affecting Ghanaians. I mentioned the major ones. In fact, all types of mental illnesses you see anywhere in the world, you also see some here. But the major ones that for now, I'll just I find, talk about them, schizophrenia, which is a major, major illness that leads to disorganization of your lifestyle, your thinking gets muddled, and you live in your own world, some of whom you see on the streets, but there are other schizophrenics who might be well, neatly dressed, and can go to work. But when you interact with them, then what comes out is what you realize that there's something wrong. <laughs> then there is depression, which is a mood disorder in which the person's feeling state is what is disordered. So he feels sad. Sadness could be normal, but if it persists for some two weeks or more, that becomes depression. 
And then part of it could be suicide. Some actually can go on to suicide, so talk about that. And then drug abuse, including alcohol, cannabis, and now shisha. And then anxiety. Then you also talk about the hospital data for the last three years. So this is uh, looking at mental illnesses and substance abuse generally. So again, it's a global picture. And just as the earlier presenter said, the darker ones indicate where you have biggest problems. So Ghana, well, fortunately, in this case, we are fewer than for elsewhere. So this gives about a 14.7 prevalence generally, which is far lower than we have in the North Americans, Australia, and the other, other parts of the country, of the world. But that shows that we have about, we have a prevalence of mental illness and substance use in the country, and that we need to be, we need to look at that. This is quite faint, but it's showing, again, the same trend, and it's listing all the countries, and Ghana finds itself somewhere here, that's about 14%. But this also shows the relationship between males and females. So here it's showing there are more males with mental illness, slightly uh, more than the females. And again, that is an interesting thing for women. And the main thing here actually is from substance abuse, because more men abuse substances than females. In fact, in the environment, if you take any 10 cases of substance abuse, alcohol, tobacco, everything, nine are men and only one is a woman. And that leads to the uh, overweighting of the data. Then this is looking at schizophrenia in particular. So again, schizophrenia, you realize, uh, so again, the deeper it is, the higher the prevalence. So we have schizophrenia in North America, uh, Australia, and the Far East, but very light in Ghana. Ghana it comes about 0.2%. 0.2%. That is still a lot. 0.2% of 30 million, you are probably talking about 200,000. So that is still a lot. And we need to recognize that. Now this is looking at depression. So again, depression, we have, it follows along the lines of the schizophrenia. So we have more in um, US, Australia, and uh, comparatively low. And Ghana comes to about 3%, uh, thereabouts, about between 2.5 and 3. Now this is for anxiety disorders. These are the manner, manner one, somebody feels that something is going to happen, something impending, there's some doom impending, but he's not aware, he's not sure, and he's always on edge. And again, it's more in the developed world and very little in our case. Now suicide, this rate is quite low, but I'll talk, well, uh, this uh, slide is quite faint, but I'll talk about that. Suicide, three years ago, there was an upsurge of suicide, where within two, three months, we had about 20 people dying, committing suicide, for various reasons. So we used our own numbers as helpline, and on a single day, we could get 200 people calling that they had issues and they wanted help. So that was a major, major issue. And you also realize that about eight, 10 years, there's a surge. And that has been the pattern in the last 20 years or so. There's eight, 10 years, there's a surge. And what happens is that when the surge comes and we talk about it, yes, it goes down, but the reasons why the suicides are being attempted are there. So at the appropriate time, it comes up, and once one comes up and the media reports it, there is what they call copycat syndrome. Then others copy, and so you have the surge. Suicide is a major, major issue. Most times it's from Depression, about 80% of all cases of suicide are from depression. For about 95% from mental illness generally, and 80% from depression. So if somebody attempts suicide, what you need to do is empathize and not to say, Ade, what do you mean? That does not help. Or else you are a sinner, or else you are a criminal. In fact, the law criminalizes attempted suicide. And this is something that we've been trying to push, that we should change it. Now, at the psychiatric hospitals, um, we have what we've, the last three years, 2016, 2017, 18, 
we have schizophrenia being the most commonly admitted cases, case that we see, and the mood disorders, including depression. And we have substance use here, uh, and we have mental retardation for children. Just a, a chart to show what it is like. So last year, schizophrenia seems to have gone down in the admissions, but it's coming up again. And the mood depression, depression seems to be quite stable. And this is uh, substance use, quite low, but it's there, and it seems to be rising. So the shishas and whatnots, you need to watch out. And again, what makes it even more dangerous is now the move to legalize, or the push for the legalization of cannabis. If you do with all these challenges, what do you think is going to happen? In spite of the fact that true, cannabis legalization could lead to some amount of money, but you need to double the money to be able to solve the problems arising from the cannabis. Now the impact of mental health conditions. While mental illness does not necessarily kill, and that is probably a reason why our policymakers, and in fact all of us, we don't seem to, be, to give attention to mental illness. If a child is dying from diarrhea, somebody is dying from some condition that will kill, the mental illness that will not kill, we seem not to recognize it. But actually, it does kill, but slowly. It reduces the lifespan by about 12 to 20 years. On the average, if two people, one has mental illness, the other does not have, the one with mental illness is likely to die between 12 to 20 years before the other. So it does, it does, it does cause problems. And it reduces lifespan from neglect by himself or by family or by health professionals or by the society. We discriminate against them, we marginalize them, uh, against them, and their physical conditions, we don't give proper attention. The patients themselves are also not able to attend to themselves because of the mental illness. So eventually, the condition worsens. And then there are some complications, you said we mentioned, violence and counter-aggression. Every now and then you hear somebody has been lynched because he has mental illness. So it has reduced his lifespan. Now, another impact that mental illness uh, does have is that it reduces the quality of life by contributing to daily loss. Now, daily disability adjusted life years. I mentioned earlier that because mental illness does not seem to kill, or the well does not kill, at least as fast as others, we seem to marginalize that. But if you look at the fact that it actually makes you lose your quality of life. Imagine somebody develops schizophrenia at 40 years, but manages to live to 70 years. The real quality of life he's lived is 40 years. So the remaining 30 years, he's lost it. So if you compute all that, you then get what you call the daily disability adjusted life years. And if you add the contribution of all illnesses, mental illness contributes 9% daily loss in Ghana more than HIV AIDS, which is 7%. And that makes it very significant. Again, it's, uh, we found that in 2007, it was the number five cause of daily loss, but in 2017, it's come down to number four. Again, it leads to productivity loss, and a study done indicated that nationally, we lose 7% of our GDP from mental illnesses, because I can't go to work productivity, or he goes to work, but he can't perform function properly, presenteeism. He's there, but he's actually not doing well. So it's a financial burden to the afflicted, and it leads to loss of one-third household income per month. But a study showed that uh, there is about 60% of the $60 household loss. When that household would be able to earn $180. So one-third of the household income is spent on mental illness, and that's significant. With all that, what are we getting? Indeed, for the whole nation, we are getting just about 1.4% of our budget sources going to mental health, when really we require about 6 to 7%. So significantly, we are not getting anything. That is why every now and then we have to cry and shout, and patients are there, and they are not getting anything. So the way forward, mental health conditions, we need to recognize that there is significant cause of the burden of disease. And as it causes 9% disability adjusted life years loss and leads to 7% GDP loss, we need to put in the appropriate resources. Depression alone is the fourth major cause of the burden of disease as 2017. 
and yet government is giving only 1% or less poultry. And that is something that is significant and we need to be aware. So that is the story for, the, for mental illnesses as a significant cause of the burden of disease in Ghana. Now, if you can address this issue of Ghana beyond aid, then we need to address the 7% GDP loss. Otherwise, it will continue to be a mirage. Now we, have, we are aiming to get 6.8% GDP by the end of the year, and we are losing 7%. Suppose we didn't lose it, and we added it to 6.8, you'll be having 13.8%. And if you have 30.8% over five years, you're already a uh, high-income country. So we need to recognize that. But there's a, a lot of hope. So I'm not leaving you in depression. <laughs> the hope lies in the fact that we pass our mental health acts, and uh, we are going to have our enabling ally legislative instrument to push for its implementation, after which we'll have a levy to be established. And it's all spelled out in the law. Once you have the levy, we have the funding mechanism by which you can embark on a lot of programs, including public education, then you know that you'll reduce the contribution of mental illness uh, uh, from the non-communicable disease burden. Thank you. We'll follow the pattern established for the first two days and allow a few questions, brief questions, and or comments. I'm glad to acknowledge that the room is almost full. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will address this question. Well, is there a concern to, I think, the first speaker? Um, maybe this was, uh, ha has been treated, but uh, perhaps I wasn't here. Usually, they say that if you have hypertension, you also get diabetes in the end. I don't know how true it is. And then those who have diabetes are not supposed to take sugary uh, substances. Or, uh, and now we are being told to eat a lot of fruits, which is good. And then if you are diabetic and you are eating a lot of fruits, does it have any uh, no, effect on your body? Uh, that, that is my simple question. Yeah, thank you. My name is Lawrence Monte. My question is on hypertension. Please, I want to know the name of the disease is high blood pressure. Okay. And what causes it is the action, the work of the heart when it's working too hard. So we all know that when you are doing exercise, that's what makes the heart pump very fast. You see, so it increases the pressure. So I don't understand why usually when they are giving advice to those people who have BP, they say they should increase their physical activity. So how does it sound? I have a question for Dr. So say, but I want to comment that all three doctors are wonderful communicators, and I'd like to congratulate them. Yes. <laughs> now, Doctor Say, one would have thought that cleanliness or hygiene is very important for anybody's life. Many mad people live in terribly unhygienic conditions. They eat all sorts of things. But in a strange way, they tend to live fairly long. I need some explanation. My name is Mercy Opoku. Please, I want to ask whether poverty can be considered as one of the causes of mental health. We'll allow the lecturers to respond to this first set, and then we can take another set if possible. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think the first one had to do with the Seaman Association of Hypertension and Diabetes. Um, that is true. Um, the reason being that the risk factors for cardiovascular diseases tend to cluster. So when you find that somebody is hypertensive, you may find that the person is also obese. And obesity will predispose you to dealing uh, to developing diabetes. So they tend to work together. Okay. Um, when we're talking about the things that you can do to prevent hypertension, we talked about reducing your weight, for example. Increasing weight is associated with diabetes. So the people who have hypertension who are obese, who are physically inactive, you'd find that they also have the tendency to develop diabetes. So that's why they tend to go together. And in fact, most of the time, when you find that somebody has hypertension, we use that as an opportunity to investigate for their other potential things that can lead you to have cardiovascular disease like diabetes. So that when we are treating the hypertension, we're not just treating to bring down your blood pressure numbers, but we're treating to reduce your cardiovascular risk overall. So that's, that's um, what I'll say to that. Um, yes, when you have diabetes, well, you're told that you have to not to take sugar. In diabetes, the, the, there's an organ in your body that produces insulin. And that insulin is the one that is able to, if you like, enhance the entry of sugar into your cells. Now, when that organ is not producing insulin, then when you take anything that is sugary, your cells are not able to make use of it. So it stays in the bloodstream, your blood sugar goes up, and that's what will make you get up at night and you visit the bathroom several times and all of that. So that's why we tell people not to take sugar um, when they have diabetes. Um, the other question was about the fact that when people have blood, high blood pressure, we tell them to go and exercise, knowing that they, their heart is going to pump more. That was the question, yeah? Okay. So the idea behind it, you know, it is not the fact that your heart is pumping more that you have the hypertension. It's the force that it's generating against the wall of the blood vessel that the blood is flowing through that gives you the hypertension. And as we said again, people who have high blood pressure tend to be obese. So asking them to be active will help them reduce their weight and hopefully bring the blood pressure down. I think those were the questions that were directed at me. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had two questions. How come that somebody who is mentally ill and is living in filth, drinking from gutter water, and is still strong, still apparently healthy? Well, the main thing is immunity. He has developed immunity. You go and drink that water, and you'll see what will happen to you. Diarrhea. In fact, it's the same way as if you go back to your holy village and the water that you used to drink when you were there. Now, if you go back and drink that water, you'll get diarrhea because you've lost your immunity. But your relatives who are there and are still drinking, they don't have, they have immunity, they've not lost it, and so they don't fall sick. So the main thing is immunity. This person, maybe at a time, at the very beginning when he developed mental illness and began to drink from the water, would have had some diarrhea. Either he passed away or he survived. If he survived, he has developed immunity. So that's what's happening. The other is that uh, is poverty a cause of mental illness? Yes and no. Yes and no in the sense that, yes, there's a strong correlation between poverty and mental illness. About 10 years ago, we did a study here we called Mental Health and Poverty, and we are trying to break the cycle. So there's a vicious cycle between mental illness causing poverty, poverty causing mental illness. We need to break that cycle. And the, correlate, the reason is that if you are mental, just as you said about the death, if you are mental ill, mental ill, you are not able to be productive, you can't go to work. If you are working for somebody, the chance are that he probably might sack you because every now and then you are coming with a school duty. If you are working for yourself, your company might break down 
because you are often mentally unwell and our drugs are also quite expensive and you don't take them for just one day. If you have malaria, you take treatment for three days. If you have mental illness, six months, it could be sometimes for life. So all this leads to mentally ill people becoming part of the, uh, those on the lower socioeconomic scale. So that is true. It is also felt that the so low socioeconomic status also leads to you thinking so much, thinking, thinking. You don't have, you have to pay your children's school fees. You don't have the money. So the thinking associated with it leads to depression and other conditions. So there's a correlation between the two. Yeah, I think that's it. If we can quickly take maybe two, three more brief comments or questions. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm Quest Maoli Felix, and my question is, in the presentation, I discovered that hypertension is an incurable disease. So if it's an incurable disease, what are the measures being put in place to control hypertension cases in our country by the health ministry? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I also join in congratulating the speakers. When I listen to all the three presentations, I can see stress as a common element um, running through. And um, I know that tomorrow we'll be dealing with lifestyle measures, etc. But I'm wondering, for instance, um, how well are we linking up with our district assemblies and municipal assemblies? Because I can see that some of these are spatial and planning issues. You want to exercise. You live in a place where if you try to exercise, you may be knocked down by a vehicle. You know, it happens to a lot of people. So how, how well are we doing this? One of the countries I go to a lot is uh, Senegal, Dakar, and I'm sure the chairman will bear me out, where there is almost like a social movement. They've turned their beaches into exercise places, not only for the middle class, but also for ordinary people. And, and I'm wondering really what we are doing to link up because I don't see it only as a responsibility of the Ministry of Health or people in the Ghana Health Service. And back to Dr. Ose, you were talking about the lack of data, etc. And for many policymakers, when there is no data, the problem does not exist. What, what is to stop us asking one or two questions in our censuses or surveys to try to derive data that allows you, you know, you mentioned 7% of GDP, et cetera. Somebody in the Ministry of Health doesn't know about it because it has not been produced by the Ghana Statistical Service. So how are we dealing with that? And last but not the least, again to you, when uh, Professor, <laughs> Professor Mr. Breast Cancer <laughs> was speaking, <laughs> He spoke, he, spoke about, he spoke about some of, some of the competitors, pastors, etc. And I would imagine that particularly in the area of mental health, that uh, you do have some real competitors that long before, if, if people are presenting in hospitals with cancers 10 months in Accra and 12 months in Kumasi, in the case of mental health, it could be much, much longer before people even present. And yet, every day, you know, and, and I know that there is now a lot of talk about regulating churches and pastors and counter talks against it. But I wonder, and uh, it was mentioned that you were a human rights advocate. And we know that in, you know, people are tied up, all kinds of things are happening to them. So I don't know whether the Mental Health Act will deal with all of these, but what, what is really happening to allow us to deal with many of these conditions which are really frightening, threatening, but are happening to people that we know, uh, depression, all of those kinds of things. So I really wonder what alliances you are forming with other groups outside the medical fraternity to deal with these problems. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, my name is Kujadesin, and I would like to ask, what are some of the end signs of the colon cancer? Because we are familiar with it, but some of us don't know the end signs of this colon cancer. That's the colectrum cancer. Thank you. My name is Christiana Solomon, and I work with Metro Television. My question goes to the second speaker who spoke on cancer. Um, he, in your presentation, you made mention that um, treatment of cancer is, is very expensive. It, it's not cheap. So the question is, how do we then put more resources into it to make it lesser? Thank you. All right, I'll, I'll start. Um, the first about colon cancer or colorectal cancer, in other words, rectum and colon. How do we, how may you know? Um, one of the commonest is bleeding in your stool. So when you go to the toilet, you bleed. And for us, every, any, anything that bleeds at stool is cocoa. And so people think it is cocoa. Cocoa really should be piles or hemorrhoids. And so they often delay because they think it's cocoa. Or a change in bowel habits. So when you are constipated and you have diarrhea, you are constipated. Now, most people may have that and it's not cancer. So the important thing is to have it checked. Okay. Um, the other symptoms usually come when it's a bit too late, uh, when it's causing blockage of the intestines and so on. But the commonest is bleeding as too. So any time, or if you are passing blood in your stools, have it checked. And then from the age of 40 onwards, it's good to have a colonoscopy once in a while. You pass a tube from, your, from the back end and look inside your intestines and make sure that there's nothing growing in there. It takes a while for them to grow, actually. It starts with little growth we call polyps. And they may be there for maybe up to even 10 years before they become cancer. So if you're checking it um, from time to time, you can be sure that if anything like that is developing, it will be picked up. Then the second one was about the cost. Yes, it's, it is expensive, very expensive. Um, fortunately, the health insurance covers by only two cancers. Only. The top two can, can, covers breast cancer, cervical cancer. But even that, um, the patients often have to spend a lot. The men have been left completely unattended. Their cancers are not covered. Um, and they have to pay for their sisters and their wives and their daughters, um, unfortunately. Um, I, I think we just have to commit more resources into, into health. We just have to, um, how to get the health insurance to cover many more cancers um, would be a good idea. And people to take private insurance as well, uh, where you can help it. Because once you get it, it, is, it can be very expensive. In, in breast cancer, for example, there's one particular drug that if you are, unfortunately you have to have it, you may have to look for up to 100,000 Ghana cities. It can be that bad. Okay, so there was the question to me about if hypertension is in incurable, what measures are the Ministry of Health putting in place to deal with it? Let me say that first and foremost, each one of us owe ourselves a responsibility to deal with hypertension. So let's not start by looking at government. Let's start with the things that we ourselves can do to ensure that our blood pressures come down. Having said that, there is a national, um, if you like, non-communicable disease policy and a national non-communicable diseases strategy. In fact, currently I'm part of a group that's reviewing this policy and also the strategy. And there are a number of measures within there that um, are advocated for to help us deal with hypertension and the other non-communicable diseases. 
So for example, there are uh, proposals to increase taxation on tobacco, for example, make it difficult for people to afford it, make it difficult for people to afford alcohol so that then they won't be able to drink it. And there are also policies at the level of the food industry um, uh, determining what quantities of salt should be in processed foods and all of those. So those are all strategies that are put in place as part of the strategy. But I think the ultimate responsibility lies with each and every one of us to ensure that we do the things that um, would bring our blood pressures down. The thing is you can't cure it, but you can control it. And that's what we should aim at doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Prof, population census. Why can't we link up with them and see if you can get a question? Indeed, in 2010, when we were going to have the population census that time, I approached them that, could you just ask two questions? Prevalence of mental disorders and prevalence of epilepsy. Epilepsy is actually not a mental disorder, but it's a condition we've been handling. My response, for every question they ask in the census, it will cost you $20,000. That was 2010. So obviously there was no way that you could have, you could have. Now this latest one about to be done, I've again contacted them in a similar answer. So that's the issue. Uh, researchers, interestingly, are also not interested in mental health because their sponsors are interested in something else. So research goes along where you are getting your sponsorship, and that is not their area of interest. So it's a big challenge, but you are still pursuing. Traditional and faith-based healers as competitors, what can we do? In fact, the law recognizes that you can't do away with them by our very basic DNA and our supernatural belief. People will go there. People who live across a psychiatric hospital, they live around there, go to the traditional healer, and it's only when they don't do well that they come. So the, so the law recognizes that. And in fairness, there is some good that they can do. For instance, they can assure you that, oh, your burning sensation, don't worry, you've handled everything, tomorrow you'll be fine. I can't give that assurance for them to be well, but they can give that assurance that unless they'll be well. So, there are some, so we are, what we've done is to recognize that, recog, regulate them, in fact, recognize them, regulate them, and train them, and let them know what they can do and what they cannot do. And they've been responding, I'm, I'm, I must say. Now, you've developed guidelines for them with which we'll train them further. There are now others, as we speak right now, about 20 NGOs in mental health, and these are not mental health personnel, NGOs. So we are collaborating with them for them to also reduce the, those competitors. So a lot is being done. What is still left is our own financial status with which, with which we can do what we're doing more. That we are seriously handicapped. And that's why I said that if you can get a levy, then you can embark on a lot more education and other behavior change uh, approaches. So this, these are the issues we are handling. Thank you. We still have tomorrow to go, but from yesterday to today, we've been hearing different things, but with a common thread running through them. By the non-communicable diseases, many of them are perhaps incurable, but they are manageable. And I would like to pick on the last thing that Professor Planjuru just said to us. They may not be curable, but there is something that can be done about them. Some of what needs to be done has to be done above our level as individuals. That's where we may appeal to government and other you know, uh, stakeholders. But perhaps the emphasis on what we can do at our own level is maybe what all of us need to take with us home. Uh, some of it is very direct. They say probably 
two thirds of us here, or maybe at least one third, have some of these problems but may not even know. And those of us who know, we are not doing what we need to do to control the situation. Before the young people catch some of the disease which some of us have already caught, <laughs> it's important for them to listen to this advice and see what they can start doing now about their own lifestyles. But I'm also worried about some of what is happening in the public sphere. If I know that I have any one of these non-communicable diseases and my diet is important, uh, but I'm working, I can't always go home to eat lunch, for instance. As we speak now, yesterday I went to one of the food points on campus to eat lunch. They brought me a stew and asked for a spoon and I started scooping the oil. And when the little side plate was almost full, I called the food server and said, do you think <laughs> I drink oil? <laughs> Look at this. Why do our food vendors in this country think that unless your stew is swimming in oil, it is not good enough? Can we target this as a public health issue? Some education for what? Our caterers. At home, we may be able to control the situation. But since many of us are, are in situations where we have to eat some of our meals outside. Can we talk to our food vendors to understand that, you know, uh, some of this can be controlled? We'd like to welcome everybody back here tomorrow for the final session. And we would like to join us once again in thanking the presenters. Shall we please clap for the chairman? Thank you very much. We'll have the third day tomorrow, and the sub-theme is social and institutional responses. The first topic would be on wellness and lifestyle changes. And the second topic will be redesigning healthcare systems. Please come early so that we would start on time. We would want to recognize the presence of these schools, Accra Academy, Accra Wesley Girls, ATTC, and Accra Girls. Let's clap for them. Okay. We have come to the end of this evening's session. Shall we please rise so that we can go down?